And our message tonight is titled The Great Commission in Isaiah. The Great Commission in Isaiah. And there's a lot of, they say that Isaiah is really the gospel of the Old Testament. There's a lot of places in Isaiah that really have a, a you know, Isaiah 53 and the crucifixion and Isaiah 6, whom shall I send and who will go for us? The Great Commission says, go, <laughs> go ye therefore, who will go for us? So there's a lot of places in Isaiah that you can get some gospel themes from. Of course, the Great Commission was given to the church as an institution. And that, you know, Isaiah is 700 years before the church ever existed. So we understand that. And of course, the main, the first part of the Great Commission is, is, to, is salvation. That's not the whole Great Commission, but it's the first part. It's the first thing. And the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And that was still 700 years from taking place at the time of Isaiah. Uh, so even though that's all true, God, give, God gave his revelation progressively and gradually. And as the Old Testament history unfolds, our God is slowly revealing more and more information and progressively man is accumulating and piling up more bits of information from God and more messages from God. And a message is starting to come together and a picture is being painted and God's uh, plan of redemption is just day by day coming closer to falling into place such that by the time it does happen and God becomes a man and God is in human flesh and God it lives a sinless life that could be an unblemished and perfect sacrifice, uh, a spotless sacrifice that is sufficient to achieve eternal salvation, infinite salvation for all. As those things happen, as our, our Messiah, our substitute, loves us and dies and takes our place and rises again. By the time that's happened, when that takes place, all that happens is 100% consistent with what God had already revealed about it. It comes together perfectly. And so tonight's portion of Isaiah, we find, I would say, one of the greatest verses, if not the greatest verse in all of the Old Testament. And it, it looks ahead to the great commission that would come, go ye therefore into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. It looks ahead to that. But at the same time, it's still true for those in Isaiah's day. It's still applicable for those in Isaiah's day as well. And it's Isaiah 45, 22, where God says, look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. What a great verse. Does that verse not kind of sum up the whole Bible? Is that not the message of the Bible? Look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. What a glimpse into the heart of God that one verse gives. What a gospel parallel. What a, 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 a heart of God toward men. Let me just give you a few pieces of it before we get into uh, the outline of the message in the text. Look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. That speaks of eternity. The word saved, be ye saved. Saved from what? From hell. <laughs> what sense does the word saved make if there is no hell to be saved from? So just the, every time we find the word saved, it's speaking of uh, the fact that there is a heaven and a hell. I mean, not every case in the Bible where the word saved is used, but most of them is speaking of our eternity. You know, if, if it was just saved from physical death, then how many got that? <laughs> Enoch and Elijah? And they're the only ones that are saved. If saved just means, if saved were to mean spared from physical death only, well, how many, how many does that happen to? Not, not very many. And so it's speaking of the second death. Salvation is from the second death. This speaks of man's inability to save himself in his lost condition. God says, look unto me and be saved. God doesn't say, look unto yourself and be saved. Look unto your own works and be saved. Look unto your own uh, wisdom. Look unto your own strength. Look unto your own devices. Look unto your own innovations. Look unto your own ideas. Look unto your own understanding. Look unto your own, um, uh, all these things, goodness and, and, and uh, uh, strength and all these things. No, he says, look unto me. It speaks to all the ends of the earth. What a scope. Look unto me and be saved. All the ends of the, it's not just to Israel. It's not just to Jerusalem. It's not just to Gentiles. It's not just to Middle Easterners. It's not just to those in this part of the world, and it's to the whole earth. Look unto me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. That is a, a, a New Testament gospel 
parallel right there that, that we're to take the gospel under the uttermost parts of the earth, that our task is not just to reach Vancouver, we've got to reach our city, but we also have to have involvement in every single country in this world. The whole earth uh, is offered salvation by God and we get a part in that. It shows that the very one speaking shows that God wants to save. It's God who says, look unto me and be ye saved. He's pleading with man. It shows that our God doesn't save begrudgingly. Our God doesn't save reluctantly. God loves to save. God longs to save. God's message to every man that he's created is, look unto me and I'll save you. He's the one offering that. He's the one saying, I want to save you. I made you. I love you. I want to fellowship with you forever. I know you better than anyone else does, and I still love you, and I still want to be with you despite yourself. He says, nobody else can put up with you like I can. And that's his message. And he doesn't, he, he, he it, that the fact that God desires to save man is really the ultimate reflection of his character and his nature. God is merciful. God is kind. God is compassionate. God is loving. God enjoys us. He enjoys hearing us talk to him. Just a few moments of prayer delights his heart. It's what he wants. It's just a little glimpse into the eternity that we look forward to where we'll fellowship with him constantly, unbroken forever. And in prayer, we get to just have just a little bit of a glimpse of that. And it may seem difficult sometimes for us, but if we could just remember, it's what he wants. He enjoys it. He loves when you call. It makes him smile. It makes him happy. And it speaks to his uniqueness. Look unto me and be saved I, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there's none else. No one else can save. Only he can. He's different from all the others that claim to save, and there are many. So let's look at the last six verses here of Isaiah 45. We'll begin reading in verse 20. We left off last time in verse 19. Isaiah 45, 20, assemble yourselves and come, draw near together, ye that are escaped of the nations. They have no knowledge that set up the wood of their graven image and pray unto a God that cannot save. That's the opposite of verse 22. Those other gods cannot save. Verse 21, tell ye and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Implied is I have. <laughs> have not I the Lord? Uh, and there is no God else beside me, a just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear. Surely shall one say, in the Lord have I righteousness and strength. Even to him shall men come. And all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed. In the Lord shall all the seed of Israel be justified and shall glory. So number one this evening, salvation is in looking. Salvation is in looking. Look unto me and be ye saved. Uh, what does the word look mean in this context? It doesn't mean merely to see. To look and to see are not the same thing. To look to here means, hey, when you're in trouble, when you've got a need, when you're needy, where do, who do you look to? Who do you look to in trouble? Who do you look to for a remedy? Who do you look to for a solution? Who do you look to for help? Who do you look to for deliverance? It's about who you look to. It's not just, that's a very different question from who do you see? Who you look to is giving some authority to. It's recognizing your need for them. Who do you look to when you're, in, when you're needy? It's not just open your eyes and who do you see? It's a very different word, and that makes a difference here. Uh, we understand that many, many saw Jesus. When God was here for the space of time that he was in human flesh, many saw him, but many rejected him. They didn't look unto him. There were many who saw him, but didn't look unto him. And they're not the same thing. You know they're different because the Bible also tells us that, that man cannot see God and live. But yet we're told to look unto him to live. So you can, you can look unto him. You have to look unto him to live eternally. 
You have to look unto him for your neediness for your soul, for the remedy for your sin, for deliverance and salvation from hell and death and the grave and sin. We've got to look unto him and we can. And he tells us, look unto me. But he also says, yeah, but you can't see me. If you see me, you'll die. At least in the condition that you're in now, if you see me, you'll explode in all my glory. So seeing and looking are not exactly the same thing. We know that there will be a time when every eye shall see him. But even when that occurs, not every owner of those eyes will be saved. In fact, many will continue lost even though they saw him. They'll see him, but they won't look unto him to be saved. In fact, in chapter 22 of this book of Isaiah, Isaiah blasted Judah because here's what they had done. They're in a time of trouble when they needed deliverance and they're being threatened. And they looked unto their armor, but they hadn't. And they looked under their armor to their military fortifications. They looked under their military strategy. They looked unto their, all of their maneuvering and diplomacy and all of their equipment and armory and all those things. They looked unto all that. They looked under their uh, natural uh, terrain and the tactical advantages that the, the geographical, uh, uh, that, that the, the topical world gave them and their positioning in the mountains. And they looked unto the ditch and the water but they hadn't looked unto the maker thereof, nor had respect unto him that fashioned it long ago. So they, they, they looked under the armor, but they didn't look under the one who made all those things. And that's really where the power was. And so he blasted them for that because they weren't looking unto him. They were looking under the wrong things. Uh, a look is for a, a remedy for our sin. And, and praise the Lord. How significant is it in Isaiah 45, 22? It's just a look unto him that saves you. It's simply a look. It's looking unto him to meet your need. It doesn't say that you get salvation by working. It doesn't say you get salvation by achieving. It doesn't say you get salvation by accomplishing. It doesn't say you get saved by being baptized. It's simply looking unto him. Looking and receiving and believing. It's just a look unto him is all it takes. And now Isaiah's hearers and those that received the written form of this would have immediately heard of Isaiah 45, 22, look unto me. It's just a look, just look unto me and be saved. There's an incident that occurred in their history that they would have, they ought to have immediately recognized as being a, a reference here to give an illustration of what he's communicating uh, about Israel wandering through the wilderness many years earlier. And they get discouraged as they often did. And they become unhappy and they become just, uh, just discouraged and unthankful. And when they're unthankful and they're unhappy, they start grumbling and they're defiant to Moses. And when they're def who set Moses over them, God did. And so when they're defiant to Moses, they're defiant to God. And so God sends fiery serpents among them. Fiery serpents. I, I wondered about that. Why were they fiery? I know what a serpent is. I don't like them. But, but what made them fiery? Like, could they breathe fire? Because snakes are bad enough, a fire breathing. And so I thought, is that possible? Because God does tell us about a Leviathan that breathes fire. And in Isaiah 27, the Leviathan, the serpent, the dragon are kind of all lumped together. So I wonder, did he send them serpents that could breathe fire? But I think the answer to that is no, because in Numbers 21, it says that the serpents bit the people. They didn't burn the people. So probably they weren't fire breathing serpents. So where does the fiery part come from? And some have suggested maybe their heads had a red thing on them, or maybe the glare of the sun uh, made them look like they were fiery. Probably more than likely, the fatal poisonous snake bite wound produced a burning sensation. When there's venom in your body, there's, I've never experienced that, but it seems logical that there's some burning, a burning feeling that takes place. And so that's probably why that is. But, but 1 Corinthians in the New Testament clarifies the incident a little bit in Numbers 21, and it tells us that 23,000 people died. How many, how many serpents are needed for 23,000 people to get bitten by serpents? Th that's a lot of snakes. I mean, I don't think one snake is biting that many people. I mean, I'm scared of the sight of one. How many does it take to bite? And 23,000 dead, but many more that had been bitten but hadn't yet died. And some, if you do the uh, little bit of digging on serpents and snakes and venom, some of the most deadly can kill you in 20 to 30 minutes, but most it's two to three days. So there's many that have, there's many that have died already. And, and you know, uh, there are people hurting and people in a serious medical crisis. 
and they're not dead yet, but they know they've been bitten by, uh, by serpents and they know all their other family and friends who have been bitten by serpents are dead already. So the ones that are still living and haven't died yet, they, they, they're sorry and they realize their sin and they go to Moses and they say, we're sorry. Can you please intervene to God for us and cause him to take these serpents away? And, and what, a, what a lot they must have been. You know, they, they're in a medical emergency, but there's no doctors, there's no hospitals. And so they, need, they don't have medical equipment. They don't have any machines to get hooked to. They're dying. And they're, I mean, have you, have you seen pictures of snake bite wounds, fatal snake bite wounds? They're quite grotesque. This is, this is a rough bunch here. And so we need relief and we're sorry for our sin. And can you take these away? And God gives Moses the answer. And here's what, here's what the Lord says to Moses. You need to go make a serpent just like those, a replica of one of those out of brass. So the answer isn't tourniquets and the answer isn't first aid and the answer isn't an antibody or surgery. The answer is, so Moses, all right, I know what I'm going to do. And he goes out to the garage and the people are like, we need a doctor. What are you going to the garage for to get tools? He's like, well, I'm going to make something. And you can see the people going, we're dying. We need a doctor. You're going out to get a fashioning tool, a gravening tool. And he's working away at me. And I'm sure he explained to them, God said that anyone who's been bitten and hasn't yet died, if you just look onto, I'm going to put this bra this fiery serpent, brass serpent on a pole, and I'm going to lift it up. And anyone who simply looks onto it, the moment they look, they'll live and they'll heal. Well, that's not the medical solution we would have guessed. It's not what a doctor would prescribe, but it's what God said. And so Moses does that, and we don't know much about what went into making it, but he lifts it up. He lifts it up on a pole. And our God, the same God that commanded it, he knows what everybody's pupils are doing, and he knows what direction their neck is turned. And the same God is in control of every molecule in their body and every cell in their body, and he can see which ones looked and which ones maybe said, oh, well, that's... That's not what I'm going to do. That won't work. I'm not going to, I don't know how tall it was. I don't know if everybody could see it from where they were positioned. I don't know if some had to walk some ways just to see it. Or if any said, I'm not doing that. That's silly. Looking at some sort of decoration on the wall is going to fix my fatal wound. I'm not going to mess around with all that. The Bible doesn't tell us. Maybe 100% of them took him up on that and looked. But all we know is that the, the plan was just look and you'll live. Just look and you will live. You'll survive. And so it's hoisted up and that happens. And, and that, that may be, and so certainly there was a great healing because there wasn't much they had to do. Just, just look. And, and I wonder if, you know, what is the emblem for the medical profession? It's a snake coiled around a pole. Now they'll, they'll tell us that that comes from Greek mythology and it probably does, but Greek mythology, I'm sure, borrows from the truth of God's word and how many little perversions and corruptions where somebody takes something that God said, puts their own spin on it, and takes it for their own. They're just plagiarists stealing from God a lot of the time. But, but a snake that's associated with healing that goes back a pretty good ways in history, I, I wonder about that. But, but by the time we get to the time of Christ, Jesus himself tells us that all of that that took place in Numbers 21, he says, by the way, all of that was a picture of me. It was all a picture of him. We know John 3, 16, the most famous verse in all the Bible, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Two verses earlier, Jesus refers to that event from Numbers 21. He says, as, the, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, uh, so also must the son of man be lifted up that whosoever believeth on him shall not perish but have eternal life. He was saying, I'm going to be lifted up. John 12, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men to me. This he said, signifying the death with which he should die, that he knew he'd be lifted up on the cross and he'll draw all men. And he's saying, I, you just have to look to me. Just look to me and I'll save you. You'll have eternal life. You'll be healed eternally. Just like those in numbers just looked. It's just a look. It's not works. It's just simply a look. He, the, the serpent on the pole represented the sting of death and the sting of sin. And Jesus, when he was lifted up, became sin for us and represents the sting of sin, the sting of death. But we just look unto him and can be healed from that forever that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He said, I'll draw all men. 
If I be lifted up, just like the serpent was lifted up, I'll draw all men, all the ends of the earth. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. And so Isaiah 45 pulls from history, from numbers, to create a picture that applies to the future part of the plan of redemption of what Jesus would do on the cross. And that's how man can be justified and made righteous. What we just read talks about getting righteousness from the Lord in verse 24. That's the only way you can have righteousness is if it's the Lord's and not yours. If you stay in your own righteousness, it's filthy rags. You're going to hell. You need sinless, perfect, pure righteousness. And you can only have that by looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God, who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. That's how you can be made righteous. Salvation is in looking. Number two, worship is in bowing. Salvation is in looking. Worship is in bowing. The Great Commission is more than just salvation. It's also, Jesus says, go ye and and in all the world, and he says, teach all nations and, and to observe all that I've, uh, I've taught you. And, and so it's all to be observed. It's not just to lead people to Christ. It's to teach them to observe all things whatsoever he's taught us. And that's discipleship. And so it's not just getting saved. Getting saved is the best and the main thing, keeping people out of hell. But we've also got to teach those who are saved how to live a surrendered life and how to, how to be sanctified and how to uh, all that. What does God want from, from saints? What does God want from his children? What does God want from you? What is God trying to instill in you? Surrender and faith and fruit and prayer and all of these things is what he's trying to do to be conformed in the image of his son. And on all of those things flow from worship. Prayer and fruit and faith and surrender and sacrifice and yielding and service and all the things we do for God, those things flow from worship. Is there worship in our hearts for our Lord? And we see worship here in verse 23, I have sworn by myself, the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow. A knee bowed is worship. Worship is bowing before him, bowing the knee, humbling ourselves before the one who saved us forever. It's a knee bowing. Think of the way that God designed the body. The body is very dependent on the knee. How important is the knee to the body? Ask Debbie. <laughs> She'll tell you. How important the knee is to the body. Alyssa, my wife, had a sustain a major knee injury back when she was in college. Her knee will never be the same. They'll tell you how essential the knee is to the body. Think about it. It's, it's essential for mobility. What if your knee didn't bend? What if your leg didn't bend? How are you going to get around with, knees, with legs that don't bend? <laughs> you, you can't do much with legs that don't bend. Uh, anyone that sustained a major knee injury can tell you how much pressure it puts on other parts of the body to compensate for and all the aches and pains from other places of the body trying to do the job of the knee that they really can't do. And so why did God design the body that way? I believe it is because of the, the importance of this part of the body that God singles out the knee to be bowed for worship. The knee is essential and worship is essential. And it's one of the most, I mean, there's the brain, of course, and, and every part of the body is important, but this, this knee is so significant and worship is so significant in our lives. We are to bow the knee. Uh, why? You know, standing tall, that's pride. It's tall and proud, right? I am big. I am f impressive. Look at me stand. A and the opposite of that is humility. And bowing down to your knees, you make yourself small and you re reverently recognize the God who is big. The standing tall and proud is a position of, of pride and defiance. A position of humility is with knee bent, bowing down. One of the ways that you know, the, the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons tell us that Jesus never claimed that he was God. And one, one of the many ways we know that's false, that Jesus indeed claimed deity constantly, is that you can find 10 different occasions in the Gospels where someone bows down and worships Jesus. And never once do you find him correcting them or stopping them. Paul did. Others did. But Jesus never did. He, he didn't stop them from doing that because it was worship in sincerity and in truth because he was the truth. And if he stopped them, that would have been against the truth. They were acknowledging truth. Being on our knees is synonymous with prayer. Being on our knees is synonymous with prayer. One of the greatest prayers of the Bible is Solomon at the dedication of the temple. Solomon offers this 
profound prayer, this humble prayer, and the glory of God fills the temple, and the priest can't even stand to minister. And after he finishes praying, he gets up off his knees. The whole prayer was given from his knees. Daniel is one of the men most associated with fearless prayer in the Bible. He prayed with the windows open, knowing the consequences, knowing that if he was caught praying, that he would face the lions in the den, and he prayed anyway. And the Bible tells us all three times a day that he prayed, he kneeled. Ezra gives one of the greatest prayers in the Bible, Ezra chapter 9. And as Ezra is relaying what he prayed to God in Ezra 9, 5, he says, he says I fell upon my knees and said thus, O God. We see this throughout Scripture in the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 3, Paul talks about how unsearchable the riches of Christ are. If you're in Christ, you are rich. How rich are you? You'll never know. It's unsearchable. You can try to find out how rich you are, and it's even richer than that. The riches that you have in Christ are unsearchable. By Christ, you have access. You have boldness with the Father. And Paul says, for this cause, I bow my knees to the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. How often have you bowed down in prayer? Do we bow down in prayer as often as we ought to? Now, there are many prayers in the Bible that were great prayers that were not offered by somebody who happened to be kneeling at the time, which tells us that all prayer does not have to be kneeling down on your knees. Otherwise, it's not prayer. God doesn't say that at all. However, every child of God who has a heart to worship his Savior and has a heart to worship the one who is worthy of worship, there ought to at least be some occasional times in our lives when we sense God calling us to just get down on our knees and get down on our face. And I would just say to you this evening, has it been a while that you've been down on your knees? Does it make the prayer any more effective? I don't know. But I know it makes me small and humble. And I know God says that I am to say I must decrease. And that's a literal, a literal way to decrease. Even the Roman soldiers who mocked Christ and scourged him, even they knew what worship was supposed to look like. They bowed down to him mockingly and sarcastically. And that's a terrible thing. But, but Romans 14 and Philippians 5 tell us that every, both Romans 14 and Philippians 2 refer to Isaiah 45 in verse 23. They both reaffirm in the New Testament that every knee shall bow. The name of Jesus is above every name. It's at that name that every knee shall bow and every tongue uh, of things in heaven, of and things in the earth, and of things under the earth. Even they will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. What's under the earth? Hell is under the earth. That's what the scriptures talk about. And, and, and so really what that tells us is that everybody's going to bow their knee to Jesus Christ. It's just a matter of when. You could either do it in the here and now and by faith and freely and to worship because he saved you, or you could do it after it's too late and do it grudgingly and do it regretfully and be made to do it to, to, to acknowledge the, the truth and the reality that you failed to in this life. But either way, every knee shall bow. And look at verse 24 for a moment. Surely shall one say in, in the Lord have I righteousness, amen, and strength. Even to him shall men come, a amen. Don't get cast out. Come unto him. You won't get cast out. But look at the, the end clause there. And all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed. What does it mean to be incensed? It means to be angry. Isn't that like a hip sermon that you hear preached by some of these hip preachers? It's okay to be angry with God. You ever, I meet people sometimes giving out tracts. Hey, you know, we're telling people about the gospel. Well, I know God, but I'm mad at him. I'm angry at him. And some hip preacher told him, it's okay to be angry with God. What does God say here? If you're incensed against God, that's shameful. It's shameful to be angry with God. Who is, who is angry with God? Those who haven't bowed the knee to him. You, you can't possibly bow the knee in worshiping, in sincerity and in truth, while you're angry at the one you're claiming to worship. If you're angry at him, there's something that you think is inadequate in him, that you disagree with in him. That's not worship at all. And so it, it's not okay to be angry with God. Being angry with God is proof of an absence of knee-bent, prostrate worship in your life. And then lastly, number three, worthiness is in no other. Worthiness is in no other. Verses 20 and 21 talk about idols and God's little G that cannot save. 
No other God can save. Hey, something that's not real, something that can't hear, something that can't act, something that can't talk, certainly can't save. And there is none else, verse 22 says, look unto me and be ye saved. And there is none else. This is, I think, the fifth time in these two chapters, 44 and 45. God just keeps hammering over again. There is no one else. Look unto me. Nobody else is worth looking to. No one else can get you to heaven. No one else can save. Nobody, there's nothing like me anywhere. Get your eyes off of all this other stuff and other junk that doesn't love you, does nothing for you, and get them on the one who truly cares. Get them on the one who matters. Bow your knee to the one who deserves it and is worthy of it. He's just hammering that over and over again. And I go back to Solomon's prayer. And he, said, he, he says some of the same things. He says that there is, no, there is no God like thee in heaven or in earth. And he goes on to say that all the earth, that, that all the earth might know thy name and fear thee. Solomon prayed that the name of God would be known and feared throughout all the earth, that many would look unto him and be ye saved. All the ends of the earth, because there is none else. Don't bow to others. What a great example is Mordecai. Wicked Haman said, bow down to me. And Mordecai said, no, there is none else. There's one worth bowing down to. I don't, you're not God. I'm not bowing down to you, Haman. Not happening. Uh, Elijah was discouraged and the Lord told him, hey, there's 7,000 still left that haven't done what? When everyone else wanted them to bow down to Baal, there were 7,000 that also like you said, no. There's none else beside God. There's one who's worthy of me bowing my knee to. It certainly isn't Baal. It certainly isn't Haman. It certainly isn't BLM. Black Lives Matter. You remember a couple summers ago, the BLM fever was sweeping the country and they're protesting and the activists are confronting pedestrians in the streets and saying, take a knee, stranger. Take a knee to bow down and revere our beliefs and our ideology and what we're promoting and frightened strangers that don't want to get mugged <laughs> or accosted, just, just submit and bow down. And that's scary that that's happening. And before long, it'll be government officials playing Haman and doing the same thing if some of this keeps up. But I praise God for the handful that said, no, I'm not bowing down to you, not happening. That whole world swept professional sports up and all the teams when the anthem is played, they, they bow down, they, they go down on their knee uh, to protest. And it's like a bowing down to their own ideology. And there's a handful of players here and there in professional sports that said, no, I don't bow down for that. I don't bow down for your ideology. There's some that said, I'm saved. I believe Jesus rose from the grave. He's the only one I bow for. God, my savior, there is none else. And I'm thankful for their testimony. So here we have the premise Isaiah's premise here is, number one, salvation is offered to all, all the ends of the earth. And he's also talking about the superiority of the true God and the Savior that can save like no one else can. And these two premises uh, lead him to prophesy here about the coming conversion of all of the Jews who are left alive. A coming day during the tribulation, verse 25, the Lord, uh, in the Lord shall all the seed of Israel be justified and shall glory. Now, we know that when the tribulation occurs, there will be great vials of wrath poured out, and there will be carnage and death, and it'll be terrible. It'll be worse than any horror movie you've ever seen, and there'll be blood up to the horse's bridles. We know at least two-thirds of Israel will die, so that there'll be only a remnant left, but there will be a point in time when every Israelite alive is saved. Romans eleven twenty six 26, that all Israel shall be saved. That's exactly what verse 25 says. And verse 17 tells us it'll be with an everlasting salvation. Verse 20 says, assemble yourselves, ye that are escaped of the nations. Now in history, in Isaiah's day, that's talking about Cyrus having released them from captivity. And so they escape these idolatrous nations, Persia and Babylon, and they are assembled back together in their own land. And that happened after the 70 years that happened in history. But that occurrence in history is also a picture pointing to the future day when all Israel shall be justified because they will be assembled then too. After the rapture takes place during the tribulation, there will be a point when many have died, but the rest of the Jews are gathered back to their land. Isaiah 11 talks about that. It says that all of the outcasts, the outcasts of Israel, pardon me, uh, the the dispersed of the house of Judah 
will be gathered from the four corners of the earth and they'll be brought back to their land. Revelation 7 confirms that they'll be brought back from the four corners of the earth. Ezekiel 36, I will gather you out of all countries and will bring you into your own land. And what happens next? They get cleansed from their idols. They get cleansed from their filthiness. They get saved with the everlasting salvation. They get a new heart. And everything here in Isaiah 45 fits into that. They come from all the ends of the earth. They'll be assembled in their land. They'll be threatened by idolaters. That army of the beast and the Antichrist, they're all idolaters. They've gone with the man who claims that he is God, who exalted himself above the throne of God, presenting himself that he is God and making himself out to be God. And all of those that follow him, they're idolaters. He is their idol. He's claiming to be God and he's not God. That's an idol. And so they're threatened by all of these idolaters. And what do all those armies and that people of the beast and the Antichrist, what do they want the rest of the world to do? To bow down to them. That's what they want. Just, take, just bow the knee to our leader and you'll be saved. Just take this mark and you'll be fine. You'll be all right. You'll make it. You'll, you'll get a resurrection if you're sick and you'll be able to buy and sell and you can get your goods and you'll be okay. Just bow down. Just submit before this leader, but the, those that reject that know that there is none else because what's gonna happen? Jesus himself is gonna show up and they're gonna look unto him. They will look unto their savior and they'll, they'll not just see him, they'll look unto him for a remedy. They'll look unto him for deliverance and they'll be saved. And I, I don't know how anyone who claims that they believe the Bible for just what it, what it says could possibly maintain that, oh, well, that doesn't mean all Israel will be saved. All Israel is going to be damned forever, and there's nothing they can do about it. Um, you know, that it's the, the church has replaced Israel. So wherever it says that Israel shall be saved, it doesn't really mean that. Well, look at verse 25. In the Lord shall all the seed of Israel be justified. Who, who, who is going to be justified? The church? All the seed of Israel. All that are left. Romans eleven twenty six. It just means what it says. If that means anything other than who is the seed of Israel, Israelites, <laughs> if that means anything else, then God is speaking in secret and God is speaking in code. In five verses earlier, God says, I have not spoken in secret. It's not a cryptic code. It means Israel. <laughs> there will be a time when all Israel is saved. They'll reject all others. They'll look unto Jesus. But man, the devil and the Antichrist and the beast, they're always offering, they're constantly offering you other alternatives and other substitutes. They just want your attention and you're looking away from the truth of God to anything else, anything else and they win. So they're always producing things that are rivaling and vying for our attention and our worship. And we've got to be careful about that. You go back to this story about Moses and Numbers when God said, okay, you're going to make this serpent and everyone who looks unto it is going to live. He didn't tell them to keep it, but they did. They ought to have just, okay, everybody's fine. Put it in the trash. They kept it for 700 years. They brought it into the land of Canaan and they burnt incense unto it. They worshiped it. Who was incense supposed to be burnt unto? God. God, God is the one who healed them. The brass serpent didn't heal them. The brass serpent was simply a picture that God used, but that situation reveals fallible man's propensity to worship anything and everything other than God. How ironic is that? It was a picture of looking unto Christ and, and not the brass itself. And what did they end up doing? Looking unto the brass itself and not the one who was using that as a picture. And it's funny that 700 years later, Hezekiah finally destroyed it and he called it Nehushtan. N-E-H-U-S-H-T-A-N, Nehushtan, which means, here's what it means, piece of brass. <laughs> Hezekiah said, it's just a piece of brass. It can't save. It's not the one who saved you by looking and who healed you by looking. God did. It's just a piece of brass. And it, where is the ark? Where is that gopher wood of Noah's ark? And where is a piece of the cross? And where is a chalice from the Last Supper? And where is the sandal of Peter? And where is, you know, a, a Q-tip used by, who, by Paul? And it's a lifelong search. We're making movies for all this stuff because God knows you're just going to worship that stuff. <laughs> I don't want you to, it's just stuff. It's just stuff I use. It's not holy. I am holy. 
God says, be ye holy for I am holy. They're, they're all just things used by God. God is the one our attention ought to be on. There is none else. There's none. They cannot save. He says, I can and will and want to, and I'm glad to save you. What a Lord we have. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for making salvation so simple, Lord. We thank you for the simplicity of the plan of salvation, that we did not need to earn it. We did not need to check off a list. We did not need to accomplish. We did not need to, to labor at it. We thank you for just making it free and simple. Lord, we thank you for showing us in your word the emptiness of all others and the worthlessness of all others, that no others compare to you, O oh Lord. Set our hearts on you, and Lord, give us hearts of true worship. Lord, may we truly bow the knee of our hearts in every area of our lives, that you might have the preeminence in all things. If there's anything in our lives here tonight, Lord, that we've stood defiantly and refused to bow down to you, Lord, may we follow your example, Lord, that you became a man, humbled yourself. And Lord, help us to submit and surrender whatever that is that we've not given over to you. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name.